I love bikes. I've, I've always ridden bikes since I was a kid. It's been something that I've done naturally. I've always felt comfortable on bikes, even though over the years I've fallen off quite a few. I've always felt um, like it's a sense of freedom. My first racing bike uh, was a bit of a sort of skip find, really. I basically hand painted up a, a steel frame, made it the colour I wanted to and, and put the bits on I could find. It was great and I could ride out into the countryside and, and just go for miles and miles and miles. I'm Simon, Simon Eccles. I work for the PACE Centre. I'm fundraising and marketing manager. Well, PACE stands for Positive Achievement Through Conductive Education. So it's specifically for children with uh, cerebral palsy and other motor disorders. We do call ourselves unique in terms of the profile of the staff who work at PACE, that nowhere is there in the country, certainly, where we have that level of expertise in, in one room with those kids. So we've developed this service for children so that we are able to motivate them and to encourage them to be as independent as possible for themselves. When I joined PACE in 2007, I was able to uh, bring my passion of cycling um, to the fundraising part of my job. We have to raise around about a million pounds a year. So when I came to the charity, I'd already done a few cycle events for other charities. So I was keen to start it there. We were able to quite easily put together the first few events and, and it's really grown since then. Having the Team Rip Corps uh, guys on the pace events is, is great for us. Deck was the original contact. Um, Deck's son, Charlie, still comes to Pace. The first trip I organised for Pace, which was Aylesbury to Dublin in 2008. Deck brought along some of the Ripcore, original Ripcore guys. By the time we got to the hotel in Dublin to meet all our families, we were absolutely shattered. Once the guy, all the guys had seen the, the families there, including some of the Pace kids who'd come out to meet us, you'd never seen so many grown men cry their hearts out. It was it was quite something to, to behold, to be honest. Ripcore are a little bit different in terms of they've been there for, since the start, so they've, they've kind of grown with the events. They've brought ideas in terms of different things we could do to generate the money. They've always brought something more to the table than just joining and, and riding their bikes. To date, Team Ripcore have been on all the pace rides that I've organised uh, for the centre and they've contributed towards over half a million pounds that we've raised and helped us fund our ongoing services for over 100 children. What are the Ripcore riders like? What are the Ripcore riders like? I remember being disappointed about my first bike. I wanted a Rally Grifter, and I got a Tomahawk, which was the cheap alternative. It just didn't cut the mustard, and, and I think for a long period of time, I was a little bit embarrassed about that. Yasmin, can I get an Estrella, please? We're sitting in the Prince Bonaparte, the birthplace of Ripcore. Team Ripcore came about through a conversation with a neighbour. He used to ride to raise money for his son's school, and we thought it would be a great idea to set something up more officially, being designers. Um, so we organised a, a riding club, developed a logo, got some kit together, and went about raising money and riding for charity. Well, 
Well, I joined Rick Corps about four years ago. I moved up from the West Country and uh, I went to a school fete. My kids were at a school in Windsor. I was having a drink at the bar and I noticed this bloke serving and uh, just started to strike up a conversation with him. We got into cycling. He had this club called Rip Corps. And did I do any cycling? I said, yeah, absolutely. I started cycling as a kid at 14. I love it. And he said, well, why don't you come out with us one day? And it was Treve. And the first ride we went out and there was just me and him, 14 mile an hour over around the Berkshire lanes, just having a laugh, really. And he told me all about it and why we were trying to raise money for the charity. It just struck me a fantastic club to join. It was my sort of club. It was almost less about the cycling and more about just being out with your mates, doing what you love doing. Riding with Team Ripcore gives me what I had in the Marines. You know, I was in the military for 20 years. And what I loved about the military was the camaraderie, being around your teammates, that sort of thing. And that's what Ripcore gives me. I've, I've been a member of other clubs, cycling clubs, wherever I've lived over the country, and they take it all a little bit too serious. Whereas Ripcore, it's just about being on the bike and having the banter with, with your mates. So I get that sort of feeling that I'm part of something, I'm part of a team. I'd like to look pretty much as much like Paul Weller as is physically possible. Again, I don't quite have the build to make that happen, um, but that shaggy dog look um, is really what I look for, and uh, Tash around the corner in Talbot Road uh, does an excellent job. What, yeah. what, what are we doing with this? A like... little Mill mod father. All right, we can do that. Yeah. We can, uh... It's a bit sweaty, actually. I know, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's you know what you've been doing? The entry requirements for joining Team Ripcore are fairly straightforward. Um, it's a love of cake, it's a love of beer, uh, and it's a love of cycling, and I would put it pretty much in that order, to be honest. Personally, I think everyone should wear a fat suit, uh, which will make me feel much more comfortable in Lycra. You know the adage of mammals, which is middle-aged men in Lycra, we are largely unattractive. Because that's underneath the helmet, that's just yeah, going to just that's... take off, that, isn't it? I think I have to consider myself a role model to be honest. Um, you see the state of some of the guys that uh, join the club, and I see myself as a, a shining light of what you can achieve, you know, uh, particularly in middle age. I'm just going to do some basic flexibility. So if you stretch your legs out, and the first thing we'll look at is a bit of hamstring flexibility. So if you just relax your leg and let me do the work. Yeah. Fundraising for the charity is always in the back of my mind. It's always something that we do. First and foremost, we love cycling. Second, we love being together as a team. Thirdly, we raise money. So it's always there, it's always part of the mix. And we're very proud of it. We've raised a lot of money over the past six or seven years. And it's just a really good thing to be able to do. I think I've changed some lives. Um, we've taken on some down and outs, we've taken on some no hopers, and we've really given them a future. Um, that, that takes them out of themselves, at least for a weekend, uh, before they go back to reality. Fascinating, interesting, charming people, great, great company. Um, just, it, it makes the cycling so much more fun if you can be out with people who don't take themselves all too seriously. So we just you know, rip the piss out of everyone every, every time we, we get a chance. Lord Hampshire, I think, is probably the simplest answer to my name. That's all I'm known as, or Hampers occasionally, as an, as an acronym or abbreviation. Uh, what do I do for a living? Well, that's it's difficult to answer. I'm still trying to work out what I want to do. I've tried a few things. Not all of them have worked out. But I quite just enjoy, enjoy being a bon viveur. I'm a lot poorer as a result of my involvement with Ripcore. But it's, it's, it's a pleasurable way of being poor. The reason for riding bikes is so you can spend a lot of money on some very sleek equipment um, and tell your wife it's worth about a third of its real value. I get a little bit um, organisational. I like things to be just so. But more importantly, and quite rightly, my way, not their way. That's clearly, clearly important. So I think they probably get a little bit tired of me being too judgmental and difficult and grumpy. Sean probably summed it up when we were out for dinner the other night. He said, Chris, he said, Chris, he said, you're so, he put his arm around me and gripped it, you're so reliable. <laughs> oh, yeah, reliable's, reliable's good, but um, I hope I can do better than reliable. But hey, that'll do, I'll take it. It's a reality.
I commute with trees, so he comes up with all of these random ideas for raising money whilst he's on the train. And one of his ideas was to take pictures of numbers one to a thousand. Did an exhibition of the pictures, and I just kind of found that I enjoyed it. And I carried on taking pictures of numbers in strange places. This is a fabulously pointless book, um, and it's a book of numbers uh, one to a hundred. And it starts off uh, all my favourite number ones, the favourite uh, twos, and my favourite sixteens, and my favourite nineteens. This, and my favourite twenty-sevens. Yeah, not everyone has a favourite twenty-seven, but a whole collection of uh, the favourite um, hundreds. There's quite a few. There's a few. In fact, there's five ninety-ones there. What makes a good number? It's a spectacular background, an interesting place, good moment in time that will never be repeated. It doesn't matter whether it's an odd number, an even number. Higher numbers are better. It doesn't bore me with ones, twos, and threes, but uh, find me a good, good ninety-four. And I don't do over 100, that's it. Not anymore. That would just be obsessive and nerdy. <laughs> <laughs>
I think riding in Team Ripcord has actually made me weaker as a person. Some cycling clubs have got rules, some don't. We've got loads. Some of them are a bit pathetic, like Ripcord rule number one about me not being able to come. Rule number one, Sean can't come. Uh, which is a bit of a shame, because, of course, Sean is the core in Ripcord. But that's the, that's the golden rule. When I'm out on my bike, I, you know, kind of look around and pretend like I'm talking to the guys, um, pretend they're there. We're a diverse group. We're inclusive, um, which is important. I think most of the protected characteristics we, we encourage and, and, and we allow in. I'd like to think I was one of the early members of Ripcore. I had to bring the age range down a little bit. They're all uh, getting grey and old and fat, so uh, somebody's got to look good in the shirt. <laughs> I think what got me into bikes was um, just the freedom, the, the wind in your hair, all that sort of stuff. You know, just the, the ambience, the scenery. Just the being at one with oneself and with others. And uh, just the enjoyment of being part of a group of people with a shared common interest. And the beer and the cakes. Are you getting a Rip Call Riders tattoo? I would recommend we all get one. And anyone that knows us, all of us, and family members as well, everybody should have a Rip Call tattoo. Rip Call tattoo? Who's got a tattoo? <laughs> I never really felt strongly enough about anything to, to want to have it tattooed on me. But, you know, this year, all the top riders at, uh, at Ripcore are going to get one of these. I want to be one of those guys in the team. It wasn't until I moved to the north that I really got into my cycling. Country lanes, moors, coast roads, you name it. And uh, it was just the ideal place to go out and ride your bike. That and the fact there were no buses and nobody could afford a car. I first got involved with Team Ripcall when I was asked to sponsor somebody to do a bike ride. And I thought, OK, well, sponsoring's one thing, but if I could actually take part and join the team, I might be able to do a little bit more. So I basically invited myself. Everyone should experience Team Ripcall. It's just a unique opportunity to ride with like-minded people, eat cake, drink lager, as long as you like to do those things. Um, finally, um, is it true you keep chickens? There's been a lot of talk that I keep chickens. I keep chickens. Alpe d'Huez is an iconic climb. It's been in the Tour de France uh, for many, many years. It is uh, 13 kilometres long. It rises to a height of 1,800 metres. It is 21 hairpin bends. And it's brutal, absolutely brutal. Alpe d'Huez, I think, is probably one of the iconic climbs that any cyclist the world over would recognise. And I think if you said to someone in Australia, someone in South America, and you said Alpe d'Huez, a, a cyclist, they'd, they'd recognise it, they'll have seen it on television. So the next planned Ripcore ride is the High Alps Challenge, and we're going to climb a few hills and raise a bit of money for pace. It will be tough, yeah? It'll be, it, it will be tougher than Box Hill uh, by quite some way. Any group of blokes that gets competitive, I mean, it tends to be more... I think it's more competitive about the bikes themselves than it is about any level of fitness or anything. For me, I want to be competitive enough so that I'm not always last, but that's, that's, as, that's as ambitious as I get. Someone will buy a new set of wheels, so someone else has got to follow on and buy a new set of wheels as well. We, have, we, we keep a tally of, of what we spent across the year and we try and keep a graph of who's spending the most. So there is a, there's an in, inherent competition throughout the team. You see it go up on Facebook, you don't think about it too long, you put yourself in and then you start to think, what does that actually involve? Training-wise, everyone's done a little bit. Treve has done less than anyone else. There hasn't been the amount of training that I think people should have done to get up the Alps. So I think some people are going to find it pretty damn hard. It's all about preparation and nutrition. You know, get that right, you won't have a problem, I don't think. You know, a strict diet of just chips is fine. You know, as long as you don't uh, muddle it up with anything else, it's no problem. It keeps me lean, it keeps me mean, it keeps me like a fighting machine, absolutely. Routine on my turbo trainer. Uh, uh... Routine's a bit flattering in the sense that it implies I do it regularly and often. Every year I've tried slightly different things to fit cycling into my routine. So you've got your heart rate monitor, your timing, uh, your video of you going up a mountain and beating everyone. Um, but, yeah, fundamentally it's trying to get away from the fact that cycling on 
a stationary bike going nowhere in itself is going to be desperately dull. It's actually one of those climbs that I've always dreamt about doing as a kid, always. I've watched the Tour de France for my whole life. It's a sport that I've absolutely adored. And I've always said to myself, that's the climb I'm going to do. I'm going to go up Alpe d'Huez one day. To actually get out to God's cycling country is going to be fantastic. As usual, not done as much training as I'd have liked to have done, but I've managed to get the last few weekends in fairly solidly. And um, how are you getting over there? What's the plan in terms of getting to the Alps? All I know about the Alps ride, I mean, I know I've got to get on a plane in London Heathrow at, I think, 20 past five next week. My wife's going, where are you staying? So I can know where you are and you're all safe. I haven't got a clue. Arriving in Switzerland, going to France Thursday to Monday, but that's it. Frankly, I haven't really given it a moment's thought. We're flying into Geneva, and um, if I'm honest, that's as much as I know. But no doubt, before I know it, I'll be heading out and looking at a very big hill. So uh, I'm in the Alps, in the coach, late at night, going up to this um, place we were staying at, and all I was thinking is, f***ing hell, this is high. Have I got to ride up this? And there was this coach kind of just taking these hairpin turns at really slow pace. Thinking, I'm not set up for this. I was thinking about if I could learn to do anything, I'd like to speak French. Uh, beyond Mange 2, Laboratoire Garnier, and Bonnet de Douche. Um, so that I could blend in more when I'm in France. I look like a cyclist. I think to be able to speak French, I would then be a genuine cyclist. We always look forward to it. The first day out as a team, you know, all their ripcord colours, just chatting about the day, you know, chatting about what we've done over the winter, the general banter, the abuse, uh, the fact that we've probably tampered with Ant's bike. Well, first day out, I, I, I personally, I probably burn half of my available energy in enthusiasm and excitement. Just getting ready to go out for the first day, it's, it's such a buzz, it really is. And you've, you've, you put your bike together, you hope you've done all your skewers up so everything's going to work properly. And then there's the anticipation, the briefing, the briefing from the, the, uh, the team leaders before we go out. It's basically down the mountain. Hey. And then I'm back up again. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it's quite easy, really. Michael is a great guy, but fucking hell, is he disorganised? I've got some sort of snack, snacky slacks and cakes and rice so cakes. Really and... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone turning up in their kit, everyone's going to be looking good. Everyone's been looking forward to this for months. So, day one, you roll off down the drive. It's just the most fantastic feeling in the world. You're going to be doing just what you want to do for the next four or five hours. We've got guys that are good up hills, we've got guys that are good downhill. Uh, we've got good guys for town sprints. Uh, and we've got guys that just look good on a bike. And I think at the end of the day, that's what counts. They're all very specific individuals. We don't fit a, a particular mould. We have tried to impose the rules of, of the Velominati, and they, they're quite specific in things. You've got to make sure you, you retain precise tan lines. You've got to have your handlebar tape matching your bike. Colours of socks, less important. Length of socks, fundamentally important. Too high just looks chav. Up hills, down hills. There's nothing in it, really. I don't like going up, and I'm scared going down. Um, it's pretty miserable. I am known to be quick on a road bike. Um, they won't mind me saying that. There's uh, a lot of jealousy, definitely, especially with the strong riders like me. They don't, they don't like it. But uh, as yet, it hasn't, it hasn't turned into a fight. Shit happens. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable at times, how serious these guys take it. 
and that's how the accidents happen. We're riding up just there, standing up to go around the hairpin just there, and then um, fully endoed, went out, put my hand out, just went over, and then saw the, um, the back wheel out. Back wheel was completely off the bike. That was close. I never thought before now to check the skewers. You live and you learn. Jesus. Cannot get me down. Throws me off on a mountain. Still get up. Good man. Respect. Hey. It's, it looks OK, but which I'm not entirely sure whether I um, trust it. I just saw you go, and I thought your handlebars had come loose or something. Back wheel was hanging off, and everything else was... Can you say you threw that stick away? The dilemma I have is do I risk getting completely mercilessly mocked for just disappearing off the back because I'm taking a picture of a number, or do I just kind of let it go? And uh, it depends how good the number is, is the option. Nice. <laughs> I, I just sort of let them go on ahead and then discreetly stop quickly, took a picture. It's a sort of dirty secret, really, that I, that I, <laughs> that I try and mask, but among friends, I can probably get away with it. That gives me an excuse to stop and take a little bit of a breather and say, you know, yeah, I, was, I wasn't tired, I was just, just taking a picture of a number. Everyone in their ripcord jerseys, it's a, it's a good sight, it's a proud moment. You know, it, it doesn't last long, because clearly within about 200 metres we spread out across the road anyway. But the first couple of, couple of seconds is awesome. We, we, look, we look proper, we look the business. From a design perspective, I think it looks good. I think from a riding perspective, it makes you ride better. Nobody wants to see the guy wearing the mismatch kit, because um, that would make him a dick. Team jerseys, yeah, absolutely right, fundamentally important. You feel so much better, you can go so much quicker, and you do feel part of a unit. And the car drivers respect it as well. They, they give you a, a, a nice jovial wave as they go past when there's 10 of you in a row. I love the fact that you can go riding for three hours and not talk about anything important in your life, and then you get back and you don't really know what you've spoken about. But the rules for Ripcord really are around about whose order is it at the bar, who's getting the cakes in, where are we stopping for a bacon sandwich. These are the, the clear rules um, as opposed to neat riding in the peloton. I've cycled quite a lot with Pelo. Uh, and Pelo's responsibility is making sure that the peloton actually does ride in a tidy way, elbows in. You know, knees not, not sticking out. Um, so I've had it sort of ingrained in me from, from the outset that one has to ride that way. Come on, kids. All right, hello. Come on, let's have someone here. I want it tidy. It's almost difficult to look too shabby in Rick Call. But there's always... there's always one. Who's got the worst kit, generally? I don't think many of us would differ from the word biggest. Chris Tate puts flowers on the back of his saddle. I mean, there are certain rules of cycling. There's a thing called the Velominati rules. But, you know, to put flowers on the back of your saddle is just ridiculous. But especially when you're the chairman, it's embarrassing. And I have to cover for him. There are numerous things wrong with this particular bike. Can you explain this? What do I need to you need to explain why you have foliage on the back of your bike. It should be nice, clean lines. You'll ruin the aesthetic of the bike. On the bike itself, look at it. Cycling's about aesthetic, about looking good, it's about feeling good. That is not good. It's freakishly large for a start. It is ugly.
Dita gets into a habit of demolishing my bike at the, at the end of rides. I normally have to take it to the bike shop to put it back together when I get home. Dita's terrifying and entertaining in equal measure. You're not quite sure which one you're going to get at which point in time. You are not nine years old. Check the handlebar tape out. That's disgraceful. This thing here, there is no place for anything like that on a bike. Hidden, concealed, grant you, behind here is this, which is a pump. It's for a mountain bike. We went up mountains. That's not the point. There's, there's a whole stack of rules, clearly, that uh, most of which we don't abide by um, because we can't remember them. Turn my saddle upside down and back to front. The skewers, which are these things, have to be in the correct place. They stole my skewers from my wheels. You can't use large bottles. You can only use 500 milliliter bottles. Turn my handlebars upside down. It was like a completely different bike. You got something else right here. Well done. <laughs> Slazenger is not a cycling brand. That's it. They're gone. <laughs> OK, these are mountain bike shoes, so that's gone as well. Why do we have to push ourselves so hard? Let's just enjoy it. I once made a mistake of having a light on the back, um, so I've, I've learned my lesson there. It's always best to take your chances with traffic and look good than be seen and be safe and get home to your family. Why do you need both of those? All our bikes have to look the same. Why? Because we're a club. We're individuals. We are not individuals, we're Ripcore. Even though some in Ripcore will say, well, you know what, that's a, bit too, that's a bit too much for us. That is just the way it is in cycling. Get over it. On some of these coals that we're going to do in the Alps, it is about a personal challenge. We're not going to go up as fast as the pros, but I bet we get the same sense of satisfaction once we're over the top. The fact that there's a team of you also means there's this, this underlying fear that you might be the one that doesn't make it up there. You get to the corner and you think, oh, I'm, I'm out of here, I'm done. But you won't because you've also got your colleagues and compatriots who are going to be at the top, and you've got to turn up there on two wheels, not four wheels. I don't like going up hills, but that is kind of the point. We start this ascent up this huge mountain, which you can't even see the top of. I get a buzz, but you get, I get really nervous because there's a lot of serious riders there. I'll be the first to hit the deck from the alcohol, but the first at the top of the hill. They can press on, they can abandon me, I don't care. Um, I just want to enjoy the view, and other than that, enjoy the evening, that's it. I'm not particularly competitive, you know, I'm not particularly fussed if I get up the top of the hill first, to be honest, it's, you know, I find it a bit immature. My objective is to get up to the top of it. I'm not going to race up it. I'm not going to break any records. I just want to make my way up. It's such a famous cycling monument. For those few hours when you're going up a hill, you think, OK, well, I'm, I'm suffering now, but it's going to be over but the kids have got to do it every day. You've taken money from people. There is this over and above everyone's sort of natural competitive instinct. There's this, this undercurrent you hold above yourself that says, no, no, you've got to complete it. Doing it for pace, it does drive you on, definitely, if, you, if it's getting tough, if it's cold, it's wet. I have Dieter's rabbiting on in your ear. It just means you can just close it off and just focus on something else. That's always in the back of our minds, that whatever we do, it's actually about raising cash.
Badger's supremely fit. Uh, he's, he's training for triathlons and all sorts. We don't see much of him, because as soon as we hit a hill, he's gone. Now, I imagine you'll find there'll be some naive members who, who won't prepare properly, um, won't get the hydration in. You know, that's really key. You, you just got to be diligent, you know? You just got to think ahead. Give me a couple of hills. Um, just prepare, you know? It's not difficult. You realise there's two distinct groups of rip call, the guys that ride in hills week in and week out and the guys that ride by the River Thames week in and week out. It's only the beginning. You know, you've got to put your heart and soul into this. It's not the sort of thing any, any old man and his dog's going to be able to do. Now that is taking the piss. See how going up a mountain, how shit you really are. You can just see the zigzags. I can cycle 50 miles, no problem. It's when you add in 8,000 feet, and I don't really know what 8,000 feet of climbing involves. There's a degree of naivety to this riding, for sure. And whilst I like all my bike stats, the worst thing about having a Garmin with altitude on it is how many more hundreds of feet you've got to climb when you're dead on your ass. Right, support band here. All right, I'm not getting it. No, I'm not getting it. I'll try a bit more. Going for it? Onward and upward. Right. I was suffering and just crawling up that hill. Your mind isn't on companionship and camaraderie at that point. It's about survival. against other people and you're having fun but it's also nice to get to the top of the hill first and be a bit smug about it at the same time. It really hurt my ass. I was on a road bike which I didn't really want to be on and we were doing hills which I didn't really want to do. It's a funny kind of thing, from exhaustion I could barely speak but equally because you're at the top you're like I've done it but I can't quite describe this right now. I was much more lucid when we'd had the steak and three bottles of wine. It's a big reward when you get to the top. You know, downhills are overrated, as far as I'm concerned. Uphills where the action is. You know what? That was a bit further, a bit steeper. Took a bit longer. Walked part of it. Fell over. If you go into the red zone, then everything just stops. Your body just starts to close down. Well, he suddenly got bad cramps. So we laid him on the floor, and he's very cold as well. So his fingers are very tingly. So it's probably a combination of cramp from the long ride, dehydration, sunstroke, that's probably my diagnosis. Anyway, we've got a proper doctor coming in a minute, so. A glass of water for him. Yeah. Matt's absolutely killed me. 8,000 feet of climbing plus today. And that was just brutal. We just climbed a mountain on one sausage, which normally would be the butt of several jokes. <laughs> well, we kept waiting for this <laughs> mythical cafe. It just wasn't there. It's no. like the Mary Celeste. We've had no cake, so I think. Uh, yeah. there's there's a... Oh, oh no. there it is. There's the porridge. Oh, that's yeah. it. Seriously, I've been doing that all the way up. I'm rubbing down the man. He's pushed himself beyond his limit for the team. Never leave a man behind. Never leave a man behind. Rule number one. Actually, rule number one is Sean can't cover. You just make the place a bit untidy. I ran the marathon in April. So that was a piece of piss compared to this. <laughs> we rode a couple of mountains, but nothing as iconic as Alpe d'Huez. To ride it up with a bunch of guys like these, it's a privilege. And for this man here, Dieter, we realised that why Dieter was struggling today is because he's been uh, wearing Bernie Winters' schnorbits on his chest. And carrying a three-pound rug the whole way up. <laughs> <laughs> There's three Japanese snipers in there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you come with me in my car? The, my office is uh, here. Uh, it it will be better to, yeah. to you, you help me. Say later, okay. Yeah. Well, okay, mate. Yeah. 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 
hasn't sunk in yet because I've looked at this mountain, I've followed the Tour de France for 30 years, watched them come up here countless times and now finally done it. And I have to say, halfway up, I didn't think I was going to make it. I was cramping up. My Garmin stopped twice to say auto pause. <laughs> I wasn't going quick enough for the signal to work. There's this little app that uh, tracks your bike rides. Any uphill segment, I'm in the bottom quarter. Coming down the hills, I'm in the top quarter. It tells you where your strengths are. If we could get chairlifts up there, mm, I probably wouldn't take it because I think I need to earn my downhill because the downhill is so, so joyous. And the thrill of blasting down those hills, it is truly beautiful. I ever thought cycling would take over my life. I talk about it incessantly. I bore people incessantly. So I think it's become an important part of forming me as an individual, as being a boring, incessant individual. Could Rip Hall become too serious? I think we're pretty grounded as a club. It's not for everyone. The banter's not for everyone. Sometimes the humour can be a bit close to the knuckle. That relationship, that camaraderie, that team is very important to me. And that's what's drawn me to Rip Hall in the first place. I don't think that opportunity comes along for everybody. And I think we're very fortunate to get that bunch of guys together who enjoy each other's company for a maximum of one or two days a year, clearly. Um, I think it's really key. It's a, a challenge, it's adventure, it's joy. But I suppose the most important thing is just continually being reminded that you're a bit of a knob yourself. It's a pretty special thing and it's great fun to be a part of it, although I very rarely turn up, so. I'm proud of my fundraising personally, but I, I think it's a collective effort. You know, I would never have got round to raising any of this money had uh, it not been for kind of bumping into these guys. Ripcore means a hell of a lot to me. My son Charlie went to Pace for a number of years and he got just the best of care from Pace and the money we've raised, and I can't express in words what Ripcore have done. It's important to me to ride in a team, especially a team like Ripcore when they're like-minded guys. It's not just about riding, it's the fun element. Most clubs are not like that. You miss them, you know, if they're not there. You miss the banter, the inane comments, the, the cake stops, the T-shirts, the designs, the lost routes, the navigation, all of it. You know, when you're on your own, you can get all of that right. You just feel part of something, and I think that's what people miss about joining a club like ours. It's feeling part of something bigger than reality, and I think that's the greatest thing about Ripcore. It's the banter, it's the team, it's the personalities, it's the fact that we're all different. It's the fact that we're all the same in many respects. We love what we do. Come along, have a go. Now we've joined British Cycling, we're beginning to get inquiries coming through. They start off, I, I think, presuming we're a serious cycling club, but what we want to try and do is get them along and they realise that actually we are a serious club, but for having fun in cycling. that Sean and I had for Sean and I initially. We never expected it to grow in the way that it has done. What we try and bring to the table is an ability to think freshly about how you raise funds, because obviously Pace as an organisation needs an awful lot of money to maintain the, the work that it's doing and to build on the work that it's doing. There's always been something around, rather than just give me some money for me to go cycling, we've always tried to do give me some money that we'll give to Pace as part of our sponsorship for a cycle ride we're doing, but in return, here's what we're offering you back. It makes a difference when you come and visit the Pace Centre because it makes something which is 
conceptual and uh, theoretical into something that's very, very real. And you see how much great equipment that they've got that helps them communicate and um, generally in, enjoy life in a way that there's no way they could if they didn't have a school like this. I don't know, you feel part of something really special when you get to kind of come raise this money, come to kind of this facility. You know, it's also about something really serious that matters a hell of a lot to 107 families. And that, that kind of means the world. People you work with get involved and want to sponsor it. Your family wants to understand what PACE does and what it's about, your kids do. Uh, and so maybe that gives the excuse for the cycling, but if you like, that becomes the vehicle for lots more people knowing what PACE is about and wanting to do something for them in their own way. Ripcore exists because of the PACE Centre, and that's how it started, to see the kids and seeing you know, the, the progress that they make. It brings it home, really. You know, It's quite poignant, to be honest. Through my exposure to what goes on at PACE, it's become my charity of choice, if you like. If I have some spare money, if I'm looking to do something, that's where my money goes. You know, that, that comes from what we've done. It seems very deep, it seems very, very from the heart, actually. Many years have built up feeling that this is really the right thing to do, a good thing to do. I just think it's fantastic what Ripco's all about. It's just great to be part of it and being there at the beginning with, with Treve and Sean and, and, and the rest of the lads joining in, it's, it's, it's something to be proud of and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm proud of it. And, and I'm proud of Ripco. To have contact with two or three people that we've met over the time whose children have come through the PACE system and seen what fantastic work it does, I think it's become ingrained in what we do. For all the hardship that these kids are going through, there's a joy here. I think it's important, it's become integral to who we are. It really helped us as a charity develop. And not only have they contributed financial benefits, but they brought to the charity lots of skills. They've brought design skills and also brought new people to our door. New members of Ripcore have come, they've joined our events. It's just a great network for us. It is good to have an end game and, and to actually be doing it for a purpose. I'm doing something I love doing anyway. I'd rather have an objective. If that objective just so happens to be benefiting a very worthy cause, then that's, that's great news as far as I'm concerned. As our network of cyclists grows, we're able to raise more money for the charity and get more and more supporters in through our doors to see the great work that we do. And as soon as they see it, they're always connected with it. I really hope the Ripcore grows as a club. I hope we grow as friends, I'm sure we will. And I think we'll still be doing this long into our 70s, I hope. Uh, I could carry on with that, I suppose, but... Oh, don't worry. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Taking the seats at the back Covering up my tracks Always seemed the wise way to go Keeping an eye on the clock Get up before the bell goes off With good luck you might make it home Did you lie in the detention room? Did you lie when you swore to tell the truth? Looking around for the clues Looking for something to use Heaven knows you're on your own Keeping myself to myself
sound Everything changes as well Wouldn't mind a hand to hold Did you lie in that attention room? 